Kyoto Koto. Um, my name is Sarah Cross. I am a senior lecturer at the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Canterbury. And I am talking today about the Kareareya, which has been spotted on the university's campus this year, which has got us all very excited. Um, my contact details are here on this screen. Um, you can email me, I'm on Twitter. Uh, and yeah, I am just excited to share what I know about these beautiful birds. So I've got a few video clips in here. This one is from Natural History New Zealand. This is some filming that they did for a documentary that was aired a while ago. Um, hopefully this isn't too blurry in the recording, but this is a, some slow motion footage of an advocacy bird, a trained falcon from the Kareare Falcon Trust in Blenheim in Marlborough. Uh, this bird is blind in one eye. He was found in a nest as a chick with an eye injury, um, so he can't hunt effectively for himself, um, but he has been a really excellent advocacy falcon uh, that was trained to do things like land on people um, and has actually been a uh, part of the captive breeding program there for a few years. Um, so just wanted to kind of introduce you to these beautiful birds. Um, he's wearing a lot of equipment there. He's actually got a radio tag on his back as well as what are called jesses, which are the kind of bracelets that they put on their ankles. So my talk today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to identify Kareareya now that we have these birds visiting campus and Christchurch. I'll talk about the biology of the species. Uh, I will talk a little bit about my own research into the Kareareya, and I'll talk about how they might do in cities here in Aotearoa. Um, so the reason for this, again, is because they have been spotted here on campus. They've actually been seen here in the past as well, um, particularly last winter. But this winter, there has been um, a female falcon, at least, possibly other birds as well that have been seen on campus quite a bit. Uh, and you can see in the larger picture on the left there, this is all from iNaturalist, which is a really great citizen science website that anyone can contribute to. Um, so these are all sightings of falcons that are actually have photos with them, which is really hard to get. It's really hard to get a photo of a falcon, um, especially since most people just have their phones with them. And so these are these are all verified. Um, I think all verified pictures of falcons that have been seen in these different areas around uh, Christchurch and the surrounding area. One thing to note is that um, in recent history, this region has not really had many Kareare in it. It is uh, these these flat plains are not necessarily great nesting habitat in their current state, um, and there may be a lot of hazards out there for for birds of prey, particularly for the Kata area. Um, so it's really exciting that we're seeing them kind of coming back into Christchurch, which is an area they would have once been in um, historically, and also on Banks Peninsula. So um, I'm actually going to show a few videos in the talk today. Um, and a few of them include these predators with their prey. Um, so this video I'm going to show you is going to have a, a, a live pigeon that's been caught by a falcon. Um, but there will be other videos that have falcon eating things, um, as well as a video later on that shows a cat attacking falcon chicks. So just a warning if uh, these sorts of things might be upsetting. Um, so this video was actually taken last year. So last winter we had a falcon visit campus. Um, this video was taken by Mark McNeil and it's from the Matariki building here in the center of the university's campus. Um, and this shows uh, the falcon that has caught this pigeon um, and has not, it has not killed it yet. Um, one thing I wanted to point out about this video is that you can see that um, the falcon, and I'll stop it there, we don't have to watch all of it, um, the falcon doesn't kill the pigeon in this video, it actually ends up flying off with the pigeon still alive, um, and part of the reason for that is very likely because the falcon feels unsafe or threatened or just unsure in some way where it has landed with its prey there. Um, these falcons in general have what's called the tomial tooth, which is a, like a nick in there or a kind of kind of like our eye teeth actually, um, in their beak that allows them to very quickly actually separate the vertebra in the back of their prey, which causes a very quick death. Um, in this case, the falcon was not feeling comfortable enough to really put its head down and do that. 
um, possibly because there were people around it on the ground there. Um, so one kind of takeaway from this that we'll come back to right at the end of my talk here is that um, we shouldn't bother the falcons, particularly when they have prey here or anywhere, um, but especially in winter in cities when they are coming into these areas that have more people around, um, because this could be a dangerous situation for uh, the falcon, which would be uh, potentially concerning. And this is hard one prey that this bird probably really needs in the winter time. Um, so yeah, we had this bird last winter. We currently have a bird here now. Um, Jade Humphrey got this amazing video of an already dead pigeon that this falcon has killed um, that they uh, caught footage of it kind of manipulating. But again, even in this footage, which I'll show you here, um, you'll see the bird is a little bit unsure, kind of feeling a little bit um, I can't say what the falcon is feeling. Uh, I should point out, but you can see it's putting it, it's lifting its head up a lot instead of, and it's looking right at the, the video taker. Um, and it's it's reacting by flying away with this prey to take it to a place where it will feel or be less uh, out in the open. Um, this is video, I think, from a little bit earlier when the falcon is approaching the, the pigeon that it has killed. Um, and is kind of, again, a little bit unsure, but you can see they're pretty comfortable on the ground. And that's because they they tend to have a bit more of a ground dwelling kind of uh, lifestyle compared to other falco species, other, other birds in this genus. And that's because they are raised on the ground. Whoops, let me play both videos. So um, this is a very extreme close-up of a male Carrerea, which uh, their Latin name is Falco Nova Zelandiae. Um, they are really beautiful, very fierce little birds. The males weigh about 350 grams, so they are about the size of a pigeon, and the females weigh about 500 grams, so think of a magpie here in New Zealand. Um, bees, despite this, oh no, sorry, um, they start out small, of course, so as chicks, they come out, they're hatched, and they are covered in this very fluffy white down, and they're super cute, and they sleep all day, uh, and then, um, and at that point, they have to be taken care of by their parents all the time. They have to be kept warm. They can't thermoregulate, but they then develop after a few weeks this gray, thicker down that does help keep them warmer. Um, so they go from being really cute to really ugly for a while. Um, and then they go back to being really beautiful juvenile falcons. Um, so this is pretty typical of a juvenile. They generally have this grayish blue kind of skin uh, or, or areas on their, around their beak and their eyes and on their legs and feet that are this grayish blue color. You can see the talon down there on the, on the toe and this grayish blue color around the beak and the eyes. Um, they tend to not have very much light streaking on their breasts or on their backs. So they don't have a lot of barring on their, on their backs or their wings yet. They do have kind of a buff light um, belly as well. So they're generally kind of darker. Um, and then as they come into their adult plumage, they get this yellow coloration around their beaks and around their eyes, as well as on their feet. Um, they get much more barring on their, or streaking on their chests and their breasts, uh, and a lot more barring on their, on their flight feathers. So you can often see these kind of white bars that are on their wings. Um, the males have this color here, although this isn't a male, but the males have um, quite a bit of reddish rufous colored feathers on their upper legs and they show them off. We call them pantaloons. They kind of lift up all of their other feathers when they're trying to show off for females and make themselves look very sleek. And they they show off these reddish pantaloons, which is part of their, their kind of mating um, ritual. So they're very cute when they do that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to identify Carrerea. So um, I ask, is this a Carrerea? Um, it is not. This is a Kahu. 
which is our other uh, diurnal or day hunting bird of prey here in Aotearoa. Um, so this is a picture from the Kare, Ka, sorry, the Kareira Conservation Trust. Um, and this shows on the left here a uh, falcon, a Kareira, uh, and on the right here a Kahu. So they're roughly, they're not quite to scale, but they're kind of close. So um, the Kahu is roughly twice as large, if not more, uh, compared to the falcon. Um, for the New Zealand falcon, they tend to be dark, like I said, even adults tend to be pretty dark. Um, kahu start out dark and get light, just like falcon do, but they get quite a bit lighter than our falcon do. Um, they, you will often see kahu on the side of the road eating roadkill or scavenging from carcasses, uh, which is very, very rare to see in, in the Kareere. They tend, they are more... Uh, picky and they like to hunt for their own food. Um, in flight, you may see the kahu's white rump, which is the area right at the kind of base of their tail, right where their tail meets their back. Um, and you don't see that on, on kareerea. So in flight, you may see that on the kahu. When they are flying, um, it's often hard to tell how big a bird is when it's in the air. Um, you can look at some of the characteristics of their flight. So Kareerea have very rapid, very stiff wing beats. They hold their wings out very straight um, and flap them very, very quickly. There is a little bend, of course, but they're they're pretty stiff. Um, they have a long tail, though the Kahu's tail is also it's not short. Um, in the Kareerea, you rare ooh, you rarely see um, too much of the primary, so you can see them a little bit here. Sorry, I'm going crazy. Um, but they are much generally more visible in the kahu, where you can see quite um, distinct primaries often visible on their wings. Um, the kahu will soar very often. The kareerea doesn't soar quite as much. They tend to fly from one point to another. Um, the kahu will hold their wings in a kind of shallow V, like the one in this photo is. Um, whereas the kareerea, when they are soaring, do keep their wings quite straight out. So I'll just show you this is another one of these videos from Natural History New Zealand. Um, and this shows some of that flight that you see in the kareerea. This is, again, that same bird um, from before. So here he is on the ground and then taking off and flying. You can see that its wings are really not bending a lot as they as they flap. Um, pretty quick, fast wing beats as it's flying around. Um, and he's just a really cool bird. So they're really fierce predators. They can take down prey six times their size. So this includes things as big as pheasants or hares. Um, this is more of what their normal prey looks like. This is a picture of a goldfinch. It's the only prey photo I had of, of a falcon. Um, this is a falcon actually up at the Wingspan National Bird of Prey Center. Um, and most of what they eat are these smaller uh, introduced finches. Historically, though, prior to European colonization, they would have been found from the mountains to the sea. So today that does still happen, but it's a lot less common than it once would have been. This is a photo that Bill Bradfield from the Department of Conservation took uh, on the Kaipota coast quite a few years ago now. And today they're generally restricted to the high country, or what's known as the high country. So these are non-intensive agricultural areas and forests. Um, and they are found roughly throughout the country, uh, south of Auckland. They are considered to be in three different forms and apologies, I've kind of drawn over this map so the lines aren't perfect here, but um, the bush form is found on the North Island and the West Coast of the South Island. They tend to be smaller and slightly darker uh, of the three forms, they are considered threatened nationally increasing, so their numbers do appear to be going up. Um, there's the eastern form, which is found on the east coast and in the southern Alps on the South Island. Uh, they are considered threatened nationally vulnerable, so they are not necessarily increasing. Um, and then the southern form is considered threatened nationally endangered, and this form is found in Fiordland and Rakura. Um, Stewart Island as well in the, as on the Auckland Islands, and they tend to be more intermediate um, between the bush and eastern forms in terms of their size and coloration. 
So like many of our native birds, the Cadaeria is a ground nesting species. They nest in a scrape um, underneath often a fallen log or a boulder or something that provides them with cover from above, which will provide them with um, cover from rain, but it also protects them or would have once protected them from the other abundant avian predators that were once found here in Aotearoa, most of which are now extinct. Um, they don't build a nest, they, they kind of scrape at the ground. Um, they sometimes will kind of manipulate some of the material around the nest, but they don't bring nesting materials in. Um, on the North Island and in some areas, they can nest in epiphytes and emergent podocarps, but that is um, not super common to see. They, like many, if not all of our endemic species are threatened because they are depredated by introduced mammalian predators. So these nests being on the ground are pretty well protected from avian predators, which is what they would have evolved dealing with. Um, but nowadays, the many, many introduced predators from hedgehogs and rats through stoats and cats uh, all can and do depredate these nests at various stages in their cycle. Um, there are also concerns with persecution, with people illegally harming falcons, uh, with electrocution, and potentially with collisions with glass. So I'll talk about that um, later when I talk about kind of living with people. Um, I will briefly go through a little bit about my own research. So I am here as a senior lecturer now, but I actually started as a PhD student at the University of Canterbury. Uh, and I did my research here with Jimena Nelson and Jason Tilianakis. Um, and I uh, was working in Marlborough, which is not the worst place in the world to be based for research, um, and was up there in uh, around, I finished in 2012. So this research is about 10 years old now. Um, but Marlborough is a, a great place to work and live if you are interested in wine. Um, it is a region that is dominated by viticulture, um, but it also are these, it's, it's two major valleys that are relatively flat and that are used for viticulture, but that are surrounded by these low intensity um, grazing lands, forestry, and then some of the higher mountainous areas. Um, and so Kareorea are found naturally and have kind of persisted in these areas in the high country. Uh, and the project I was looking at was whether or not they could do so in the vineyards. Um, so I'll just skip this, this little video, but um, the project I was studying was started by a company called International Wildlife Consultants, which is uh, based out of the UK. And what they were doing, uh, they received funding from the Sustainable Farming Fund and from New Zealand wine growers for a project they called Falcons for Grapes, which was reintroducing falcons from the high country into these river valleys. Um, these are areas they would have historically been found in, but have been kind of driven out of through habitat change, through introduction of predators, and very likely through persecution by people. Um, so the idea was their, their populations are not necessarily, or at the time were not necessarily increasing in the high country, but because there are so many introduced birds that are causing damage to the vineyards, that there would be plenty of food for them in the vineyards if only they could kind of get there. And at the same time that they would then provide grape growers with a natural source of pest control because most of the birds that are in these vineyards are introduced species and there are virtually no natural predators for them until there's a falcon around. Um, so as a PhD student, I came into this looking to see if the assumptions of that project were true or were, were correct. So first, are the falcons providing, are they kind of living by that name of falcons for grapes? Were they providing the grape growers with uh, a service by being present? A little bit about the grape damage. The three, there are four species that cause damage to grapes in New Zealand, or primarily. Um, there are three introduced species, European starlings, Eurasian blackbirds, and song thrushes. These species all will pluck whole grapes off of bunches. So it kind of looks like if you or I were to pull grapes off of a bunch. Um, this is one particularly well-consumed <laughs> bunch of grapes. Um, normally, you wouldn't see every single grape having been removed. And then there is the Tauho, the silver eye. Um, this is a self-introduced native. It's a very small bird. They weigh, they weigh about 13 grams. They're quite little. 
Um, they often will be found in small flocks in vineyards in the fall, and they like to peck holes in grapes to drink the juice from inside. And this can cause not only a loss of yield, but it can also increase fungal infection in the grapes because once they have that open wound, um, fungal spores can get in there and start growing and that can reduce both yield and the quality of wine. So neither type of damage is damage that growers want happening. So we compared vineyards that had falcons present in them with vineyards that did not have falcons in them. Um, these were not huge sample sizes, but there, there were enough to do these tests. Um, and we looked over the course of a growing season, how many birds of each of these species were found in those two types of vineyards. And what we found was that falcons had a significant impact on the number of song thrushes and blackbirds, and that was statistically different. Um, they did seem to have a large impact on starlings, um, but that in, impact was uh, non-significant, although you can see that generally these gray lines, these solid lines are where falcons were present in the vineyard. Um, those are always low here for the starlings, um, but in, in non-falcon vineyards, there were either large flocks or almost none. Um, and the stochasticity of the data is likely why we didn't see an impact of falcons. And that may be because of our smaller sample sizes as well. Um, and then we actually found there was no impact of falcons on silver eyes and falcon presence was removed from our models on what predicted silver eye abundance. The big picture here though, is that when karere were present in vineyards, there was a nearly 70% reduction in the amount of damage to both Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir in both the edge and the interior of vineyards. Um, this was financially meaningful for growers. Um, and we found that this was made up largely of uh, a lot fewer removed grapes, so about 95% fewer removed grapes and about half as many pecked grapes. And that's interesting because we didn't find an effect of Falcon's boop on the silver eyes abundance, um, but we are seeing an impact of falcon presence on their foraging and how much damage they cause. And that's likely because of what's known as a landscape of fear effect. So it's not necessarily that the silver eyes aren't, aren't leaving or are leaving. Um, it's that they are uh, a lot more cautious and perhaps not spending as much time foraging in the open habitat of the vineyards as they would uh, if there was no falcon around. So from a conservation perspective, is living in intensive viticulture a good idea for this treasure, this uh, treasured Tonga species? To understand that, it's a little bit harder to, to kind of study, but I used um, remote videography, which are kind of nowadays packaged up in nice little trail cameras. Um, but I used video monitoring of of falcon nests, um, a total of 10 nests and got over 2,800 hours of footage to look at. And I'm gonna show you a video now that has that um, footage of a cat that's um, attacking a falcon nest. So just FYI, and it's a series of videos that are all clipped together. So I'll just kind of briefly describe them as they go through. So these are um, two parents at a falcon nest with eggs in it. So the male has just left and the female is coming in to get down and settle down on her chick on her eggs to brood them. This is two kind of awkward phase chicks that are looking around. This is a falcon bringing a rabbit in. This is a falcon bringing a bird in. This is the footage of that cat, which killed all three chicks in its nest. That is a falcon chick. That first one was a falcon chick uh, with a stoat that was brought into the nest as prey for us. So they're not only preyed upon by introduced predators, but they may also hunt, or they do also hunt for them sometimes. Um, and this last one is showing a male bringing food in uh, and the female took it off him right away and will be feeding her chicks with it. Um, so just some snippets of falcon life at home um, in these sites. Uh, what we did find, um, like most species uh, in this genus and, and many birds in general, the females do most of the nest attendance. They spend most of the time in the nest compared to males who are out doing all the hunting for the family. Um, females spend progressively less time in each day in the nest as the chicks get older and start to spend a lot more time also hunting for, uh, for prey for them. Um, 
We did find that nest attendance was higher in the vineyards, um, although this may be uh, related to the fact that uh, vineyard falcons were provided with food ad hoc if they wanted it um, by the vineyards themselves. We never saw them providing that food to their chicks. I think we actually know we did see it in one nest, um, but they may have been supplementing their own diet with the food that was provided to them. Um, but in any case, the management in the vineyards um, was allowing the females to spend more time in their nests. We did an experiment uh, using wax eggs to try to understand whether or not eggs were more prone to being preyed upon by introduced predators or any predators actually um, in the high country, which in this case is called hills or in the vineyards. Um, we made these eggs, we kind of colored them to look like falcon eggs. We um, scented them, we left them to cure outside for many weeks and, and scented them by placing them in amongst a lot of um, falcon nesting material from the captive falcons at the Carrera Falcon Trust. Um, and then we placed them out in these different habitats for four weeks, which is the duration uh, of incubation in the species. Uh, we checked them after two weeks. They were tethered to the ground using, oh, sorry, using this wire kind of tether um, so they couldn't be taken away. And when predators tried to chew on them, they left marks and they were very easy to then kind of line up with the, the known kind of bite marks of different predator types. So we found that um, more of the hill nests were predated at two weeks, so and more were predated in general, 63% versus 38% in the vineyards. Um, stoats, which is this orangey colored um, middle kind of bar inside the stacked bar chart, uh, were found as predators. They, they did attack a number of the eggs in the hill nests and were not present in our data, sorry, for the vineyard nests. Um, and they were, sorry, someone's knocking at my door. Um, uh, sorry. And yes, we also found hedgehogs, um, rats, harriers, uh, kahu attacking, uh, eggs as well. So, um, kind of interesting findings there. Looking at the video footage of potential predators, uh, there was that case of a feral cat that killed all three chicks in one of our nests. Um, if you want to watch more of that footage, it's on the doc website. If you search for their New Zealand Falcon page, you'll find that footage from my research. Um, there was a brush-tailed possum that entered one of the hill nests, but actually didn't, you can, oh, I'm pointing with my hand, um, the eggs, this was the one that actually had the video of the uh, parents and the eggs earlier. The eggs were not actually damaged by this uh, possum and it was chased off by the female eventually. Um, in this video, a harrier, which you can sort of just see the shape of, this is its wing and this is its tail, um, flew in and uh, was, was kind of rebuffed by this female falcon. This video uh, showed a rat. It's really hard to see in this grainy still shot, but this was a rat that the female falcon stood her ground against and um, was able to, to chase off or didn't get into the nest. This is a vineyard nest. This is showing um, this nest and this nest were both raised off of the ground in mussel barrels from the mussel farming industry that were um, opened up and filled with nesting material or material that they could nest on as their scrapes. So these were birds that nested on the ground and then their nests were raised up into these barrels um, and they, they uh, used them, which was really cool. Um, and that protected them from predators like this hedgehog. So this was in a vineyard. This could have been a predation event had that bird been on the ground. And then this last one is showing a, a stoat, which attacked this chick. It's actually the same chick that was in the video that, that you saw earlier that was carrying a stoat in her beak. Um, that was fed a stoat by her parents. This stoat came into that nest um, when that chick was actually quite old and basically ready to fledge. And it attacked her. And in the video, we saw her um, in the dark fly off with this stoat attached to her rump. Um, and it's you know a close-up video, so we didn't really see what happened after that. And we couldn't find her. We were doing observations of the juveniles after they left their nest, and we couldn't find her um, when we went back to 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 watch her when we presumed she would be out um, learning how to fly and, and playing around. Um, but actually we went back uh, another week later just thinking we, we should check just to see and we, we did find her again. So she managed to survive that very kind of terrifying, I guess, 
first flight with a predator attached to her backside. What do falcons eat? Um, in both the high country and the vineyards, and that the high country kind of includes forestry as well in this case, um, they predominantly eat introduced species, and they actually eat them more often than expected given their abundance in the surrounding habitat. Um, and they don't eat that many of the native species, um, but they eat them less often than they would given the abundance of those species in the surrounding habitat. So essentially everything above this line are species that are hunted more often than you would expect, and everything below the line are species you would, that are eaten um, less often than you would expect. Um, I'm just going to skip that one. They uh, don't eat native birds very much, but they sometimes do. Um, so they are kind of a generalist predator or a generalist bird predator. And so they will eat what is abundant in an area and they will eat what they can. Um, and so there have been some cases where Carrerea have been uh, present in areas where there have been sensitive species and that has been a concern and something that needs to be managed either by not using that area um, or by potentially translocating birds if there's a problem. Um, they can also hunt in really unusual ways. These are both stuff articles. Um, the one on the right is uh, some observations from Colin Miskili uh, from Te Papa, which were um, examples of Pareira hunting in the dark or hunting um, in like going into the burrows of seabirds, which are, are things you would not normally see in falcon species. Um, falcons may uh, or do also eat berries, it turns out. Um, so Laura Young, when she was a PhD student here at Canterbury alongside me, actually, um, she was studying Kia, did really incredible work on them. And she observed when she was up in the field, uh, Carrerea eating um, the fruit of a plant, uh, I think it was a snowberry, um, and then went and found the feces of that, that bird. Uh, they saw it eating some of these berries and then, they, and then it pooped. So they were able to go and they were able to look through the feces and see what it had consumed. Uh, and they actually found the seeds of these two species in uh, that excrement. So not only was it eating these berries, but it was actually acting as a seed disperser, which is not something that we normally think of falcons as being able to do. Okay, so um, falcons in my study appear to be no worse in intensive vineyards uh, than they were in the high country. So that kind of is a good place to start thinking about how they will fare in cities. Um, they are found in our cities here in Aotearoa, so they're pretty rare here in Christchurch, but they're quite common in Wellington. There are even breeding pairs in Wellington. The Wingspan National Bird of Prey Center in Rotorua has been releasing chicks in Rotorua and in Taupo. Um, there have been Kareria in Queenstown, in Blenheim, of course, where I was doing my work, in Nelson. I was once playing a football game and Nelson and the Carrera flew right over the field. Um, so they are living alongside us in a lot of places throughout the country. Um, part of this may be because there is plenty of food in most of our cities. So there are particularly a lot of feral pigeons, which are a major problem in some cities um, because they can reach really high numbers. And part of the reason they might have such a high abundance in our cities is because we don't have natural predators for them. Um, so falcons may be responding to the presence of a lot of this food by coming into cities. And they seem to be more common, at least in Christchurch, but I think in other cities as well, um, uh, as winter visitors. So we're seeing these birds come in in the winter um, where there's a lot of food available here and there may not be as much in some of the high country habitats. Um, I, I highlighted pigeons here, but I should really point out that they are, they will hunt for and likely um, most of their food is going to be some of those smaller introduced finches uh, as well in the cities. Um, so all of the risks that are potential risks for these birds in the high country are definitely also a concern in cities. Um, predation may be a concern there. Um, they are nesting in some of our cities and we can in cities have pretty high abundance of some of the introduced predators. I think we'd have to be particularly careful with um, both feral cats and unowned cats and potentially in, with pet cats in our cities. 
um, depending on what their lifestyles are like and their potential to cause a lot of harm if a falcon was to nest in uh, in a city. Um, there are certainly concerns with persecution, um, with electrocution, and with glass. So I'll talk about electrocution first. Um, the big issue for Kareerea, which is also a problem for other larger birds in Aotearoa, is that these transformer poles that you see all around the countryside as you're driving around, these are taking the high voltage transmission lines, which I've kind of badly photoshopped in this picture, um, but taking those lines and transforming the voltage into the voltage that we use in our homes and offices and you know all situations. Um, these lines, when they come down, are not insulated. So they are live and the box itself is grounded. So if anything was to land on this box, which kind of presents itself as a nice place to sit um, and touch any one of these wires or touch the two wires as they're flying in, they would form a circuit and that electrical current would pass through them. So in normal, well, not normal, in, in many situations, electrocution does not appear to be as big a risk because when there are lots of natural perches, lots of trees available for Kareira to perch in, they don't necessarily need to use those uh, those power structures. But as we remove trees from the landscape and replace them with, say, housing or, or agriculture, particularly housing means removing trees and actually putting more transformers in, um, this can lead to fewer and fewer natural perches for birds like Kareere to use, which may end up having them perching on these transformers. So this photo on the left uh, does show two different falcons um, perched quite close to one of those transformer boxes. And you can see they're very at risk there of being in a situation where one of them could decide, could put a wing out or could kind of try to clean its beak on one of those wires. Um, but there is really good work being done now to try to remove this risk from our landscape. And I should point out that in some areas of the world, like in North America, um, most transformers have to be insulated. So this is not um, it's purely a problem here in Aotearoa, um, but it is something that is um, mandated in many parts of the world as a way to mitigate the risk to birds of prey in particular. Um, so Mulber Lines and the Otago Power Company Aurora Energy are insulating their old power lines to protect the uh, because of the fact that we know that this is a particular risk for them and has killed a lot of, of birds. Persecution is also a big problem. There's a, a history of persecution of birds of prey here in New Zealand. Um, people do still illegally continue to harm them, um, particularly uh, people do shoot them sometimes. They are uh, Tonga species, they are fully protected in endemic species. It is highly illegal to do this. Um, and it's really, really sad that it does It does sometimes happen. We think it's happening less though, as we all learn to, to treasure these birds. And part of the effort that I've been involved with um, and that continues today with the Kare Area Falcon Trust is work to try to educate kids um, and the community about these birds and introduce them to these birds and, and to kind of get to know them uh, so that they realize how, how special that they are and how cool it is that we get to live alongside them. And I'm particularly proud that in Blenheim, um, in Marlborough, uh, quite a few of the sports teams have been renamed the Falcons in the years since we started doing these school programs up there. The other hazard I want to talk about is glass. So this is an iNaturalist, uh, one of those points on the map I showed you earlier. This is an iNaturalist um, uh, observation of a bird that actually flew into this glass building in Lincoln um, here in the Canterbury Plains. Um, the video that I showed you from Matariki, the reason that that videographer actually noticed the bird in the first place was because it flew into the window and made a big loud bang before it went down to um, to take that pigeon. So um, in that case, the falcon did survive. In this case, in this photo, the falcon died. Um, glass is a really big hazard for birds around the world. Um, the photo on the right here is showing some of 3,000 birds that died in Toronto. Um, it's from a group called FLAP in Canada um, who go around and they have citizen scientists that collect the birds that collide with buildings and die. 
Um, but uh, it's probably not as big a problem in Aotearoa because we don't have as many migratory birds, but it potentially can be a really big problem, um, especially as our cities become more biodiverse, which is something that we should all celebrate and treasure. Um, and as buildings modernize and replace or, or put up large glass facades. Um, so a kind of highlight here is that uh, the Wellington Cable Car um, Museum, um, I think, had problems with kereru flying into their windows. So you can see the imprint of one here. And so they retrofitted their windows with this bird safe glass um, kind of uh, alternative that can be put on windows after they've been put up, which has these many dots in this grid pattern. Um, that usually doesn't alter the view that much unless you kind of focus in on the dots, you, you really don't notice them, but it does make it more visible to birds and really reduces collision risk for birds. Um, so that's something that I think we should be keeping an eye out on. It's very likely to become more and more of a problem throughout the country. So um, if you want to learn more, you should go to the experts, the Karairea Falcon Trust in Malbra and the Wingspan Bird of Prey Center um, in Rotorua. Um, here in Canterbury, we have the Oxford Bird Rescue and the South Island Wildlife Hospital as well as, well as many um, uh, different rehabilitators. These people put a lot of their energy and time into saving injured birds. Um, if you do on our campus find an injured bird or, or anywhere in Christchurch, um, you can contact me, you can contact um, either of these, any of these organizations, actually. Um, you can also reach out to the Department of Conservation. Their rangers will, will help you. Um, and uh, hopefully you're not ever in that situation that you have an injured bird uh, to, that you have to try to help. Um, I did want to point out, I really hope that Kadaria remain in Christchurch and continue to visit our city. And I, I don't, I would not be surprised if we start to see them nesting in the Port Hills area in the near future. Um, if you are ever in close proximity to a falcon nest, you will know what this photo looks like. Um, please don't get in very close proximity to a falcon nest. I was uh, in this video doing my research and had um, special permits to be able to be this close to the birds. And I certainly did not like being there as you will see. Um, and we got in and out as quickly as we could to uh, change batteries and stuff, but never actually only went into the nest to put the cameras down uh, and then had all of our recording stuff about 50 meters away. Um, so this is at 50 meters away from a falcon nest, but um, this is what happens. I'm still wincing about this. Um, so thank you for watching. Um, please do reach out via email or Twitter. Um, or if you're a student and you want to come see me on campus, please do. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. And please report your falcon sightings on iNaturalist or eBird or, or however uh, you would like to. So thank you very much.